Welcome to our latest video interview. Today we're delighted to welcome Lord Peter Cruddus and the former MEP David Campbell Bannerman, uh, who will have quite a lot to say today, we think, about democracy, about conservatism, and about how things develop going forward. So, uh, Peter, can I ask you to introduce yourself to the audience? My name is Peter Cruddus. Uh, I'm a businessman. Um, I'm a member of the House of Lords. I'm a paid up member of the Conservative Party. I uh, have my own charitable foundation, the Peter Cruddus Foundation. Thank you. And uh, DCB, David Campbell Bannerman? Yes, I'm a former MEP uh, for 10 years for the East of England, heavily involved in the Brexit referendum. Uh, I was previously chairman and uh, deputy leader of UKIP. I've seen both parties. Um, and uh, I've been involved in politics for about 35 years. I, I did a lot on trade models such as Super Canada, which is basically where we are today, uh, the actual nature of the model of the relationship with the EU. And that was pretty much adopted. So um, trade is a big thing to me. Let's start with uh, the CDO. Uh, Lord Cruddus, can you explain to us what is CDO and why was it necessary? David and I, um, you know, created co-founders uh, with others of the Conservative Democratic Organisation. What happened last year was um, all the shenanigans around uh, Boris's removal of Prime Minister. And we felt as a group, uh, we didn't really know each other. We're all volunteers. We don't get paid for, for any of this. Uh, we came together because we felt that the members' voice should be heard and we as members felt that um, we wanted to have Boris Johnson on the ballot for a leadership uh, campaign against whoever else the parliamentary party wanted to put up and what we discovered was that uh, within the constitution of the conservative party if we got enough members voting then we could we could add Boris to the ballot and that was the basis of the creation of conservative democratic organization uh, just so that the members could be properly represented and so their voices could be heard we felt there was a real democratic problem in the sense that i'm um, rishi sunak i'm afraid that the way he was appointed um is a real problem democratically it's not personal to him we're not anti-rishi per se um but you know two months after he was rejected by the conservative party membership he was imposed basically by MPs on the members without any confirmatory vote or anything. So it, it again brought attention back to the, the problems of democracy, and it just came to a head. Members were leaving in, in droves, and we felt, well, look, we've got to address this uh, democratic whole. Our audience will probably want to know who is behind the organisation, um, and are, are there any big names that you've got on board? We are a membership organisation. We have determined to come up the way from the members. That's the whole point of it, to re-empower the members and for the members to take back control. Uh, we're not anti-MPs in that sense, but we do have people like Priti Patel, who's got a long record of actually being very pro-party reform and, and party democracy. We've got support from, uh, we're coming to our conferences, Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, and Nadine Doris, um, there are quite a number of others that do support us, and we'll be making an announcement as a, to our uh, regional network pretty shortly as well. There are a four group of people. There's about eight of us, nine of us, and they're experts in their various fields. There's my expertise as a businessman, uh, as a Conservative, and as a major donor to the Conservative Party and a member of the House of Lords. Uh, David's expertise on um, European Union. Then we have uh, a couple of uh, barristers, uh, constitutional experts, um, party uh, PR agencies and so on. But they're all volunteers. They're all coming together to represent the membership. It is a very powerful and strong group of people that are not in it for themselves. None of these people, apart from the politicians are really um, involved in day-to-day -day politics like the politicians. We've all got day jobs and we're doing this as 
you know, out of loyalty to our party. We are with the Conservative Party, but we want the members to have a much greater say and not to be disenfranchised from any leadership campaigns in the future. We actually think struct structurally the way a leader is elected, where the parliamentary party whittle it down to two people, is wrong. And, you know, we get presented with a choice of two people that they have put forward for various means. And we think that there's a conflict of interest in the process. There's a lot of false bartering, vote lending that goes on in Parliament behind closed doors. It's a secret ballot. Nobody seems to know how uh, MPs are put forward, elected. And we think there's a, a shift in power that we need to address. And that should start from grassroots members. And um, so we're quite, but we have a very, very strong team of excellent people backing us. What do you feel about the, the way that uh, Party HQ has imposed candidates on constituencies? And will CDO be able to make any difference? When it comes to candidate selection, um, there's a major problem there. We're getting too many compliant people, too many careerists coming through, and that the public have picked up on this. They they can see there's a lack of quality, to be honest. Why has that happened? Well, the members have been disenfranchised. Central office is far too powerful. It, it's socially engineers. There's too many token candidates. Um, and and the way to get to to sort it out is get back to the members, give local associations the full choice of candidates. All central office should be doing is to eliminate the bad, the mad, and the sad. That really is fundamental to British democracy and is at the core of what CDO is about. At the moment, we seem to have a little bit of a crisis at uh, at the top of government where. HMG, uh, in the form of uh, Rishi Sunak in the cabinet, are pushing through one particular uh, policy at the moment, whether or not that is necessarily the views of the membership. So how do you see policy making going forward within the party? We've got a thing called the Spring Forum, which is actually taking place just a few days after this interview, March 24th and 25th in Birmingham. And the Spring Forum is a bit of a, I wouldn't say it's a waste of time, but it, it's its a grudge meeting that has to be done because of the Constitution. Well, we want to turn that into a policy conference. So every year in March, people can come together and come up with policy ideas. And ministers have to come along and listen to them, not speak at them, but listen to them. And then those ministers can take those ideas away and come back at the full conference in October, the normal one, uh, and to, you know, then give their big speeches about what they think is the right way forward. Uh, policy is very important to this. And CDO, we're not a Tory momentum, by the way. We're not, we don't have our own manifesto. Um, but our members are very interested in policy. And we re-empower the members. Then we'll see a natural swing towards Brexit and more towards the centre-right policies that I think many of us want to see. If you were to look across the party structure, you know, everywhere you look, we see snippets of dysfunctionality. So in the way that leaders are elected, the way that members are disenfranchised, the way policies are formulated, the way conference is held now, it seems to be like a business conference. Let's raise as much money as we can and We'll try to fit the members in. We'll give them half a day here and half a day there. I'm a businessman. I've had my own company for 30 odd years. And the one thing that I do, if I ever have a problem in my company or something I'm not sure of, I ask the employees because they normally got the answers because they are on the front line of the business uh, that we're running here. And we genuinely think that uh, we're not here to disrupt government. We're not here to oppose MPs per se. We genuinely think we're doing the right thing for the Conservative Party to get it back on track and to be and continue to be the most successful political party in the history of sovereign nation democracy. We've got a vote coming up uh, tomorrow um, from the current Prime Minister, who, as you pointed out, Peter, was not actually 
elected by the Conservative Party membership. In fact, he was rejected, but then subsequently became Prime Minister. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on that and where CDO stands on leadership generally? I mean, this is obviously a policy issue in delivering Brexit. I mean, we are generally, we're pro-Brexit, obviously. We, we represent the whole party, uh, CDO. Um, and it's important to defend sovereignty and for the, the whole of the United Kingdom. I mean, CDO has representation in Northern Ireland. We have a regional director there, and we want to stand in Northern Ireland properly. The, the Conservative Party has been, you know... <laughs> Uh, hardly actually uh, organised properly when it comes to Northern Ireland. It has a few candidates here and there. But we want to do it properly because the United, Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom and that really matters to us. And we, we lost our way on that. You know, we've got to rebuild that. And also in Scotland and Wales, you know, we are very pro-union and we will have strong representation right across the UK. I was a co-founder of Vote Leap. And uh, I, I was um, in a board, uh, I was a director, I was a treasurer of Vote Leave, and I fought, you know, Brexit on the front line. And, um, you know, I don't believe that what the British people voted for has been delivered. And we've, we've seen the way Parliament has dealt with Brexit and, you know, uh, the way that uh, we have not been able to get agreement with the European Union. This takes us back, I think, to the issues that uh, we raised earlier about candidate selection. Seems to me there's been an engineering of the Conservative Party, um, not, you know, over the last 10 years, um, to bring in pro European sort of candidates and try and tip the balance in the way, you know towards uh, a Remain-type party. It seems the party, to me, is at best a centre party, uh, but probably I would describe it today as centre-left. And Boris came in and tried to drag us back to what he promised, uh, what we promised at the 2016 referendum, which was voted for by a record number of people, 17, uh, in excess of uh, 17 million people, a record number of votes for any democratic process in the history of this country. And what we've seen, what we're seeing with the Windsor framework is another sort of uh, dilution of what the British people voted for back in 2016. Would you, Peter, expect to see a Conservative Prime Minister putting forward the Windsor framework? Good loaded question. I mean, the, the point is, do we have a Conservative government? I mean, high taxes is anti-Conservative to me. Uh, the Windsor framework, to me, is not what the British people voted for. It seems like a compromise. Uh, politicians have to make these decisions, but politicians make them complicated for themselves. Uh, I think we have a centre-left Conservative Party at the moment, and that's not been very successful for, for any political party or most, you know, all political parties in this country over the last hundred years, the most successful political party is the Conservative Party for centre-right policies. So I don't I don't think the Windsor framework's a centre-right policy. I don't think higher taxes are. I think lower taxes, lower corporation tax doesn't affect me, my life around taxes. I'm a UK resident. I pay all my taxes. Um, doesn't change my life what corporation tax is, but, you know, uh, just want to want a Conservative government, really. The hike last week in corporation tax by around about 30%, from 19 to 25%. As uh, a businessman yourself, you, you clearly must have a view on, on that. I co-signed a letter calling for the, the increase not to happen. I like paying taxes, believe it or not. I put this in my book, Passport to Success, because somebody has to pay for the country. But the the reality is, is that the big conglomerates can move business around to different parts of the world and avoid paying higher corporation tax. It hits the small and medium-sized enterprises in the country. 
And I know that firsthand because when I was developing my business, um, the less tax you pay, the more people you can employ, the more you can invest. We have our conference 13th of May in Bournemouth, and we will announce the venue in due time with these big speakers. But we want to set up a range of policy working groups. As I say, we're not looking to do a whole manifesto, but there are certain areas that have got overlooked um, in terms of policy. And, and as Peter rightly says, you know, we're looking to centre left. So we can address that uh, without sort of seeking to put a whole mm. manifesto forward. And I think that is part. And the closer we get to the membership, the more likely we're going to get centre-right policies. The reason we're getting a centre-left government is that it's not democratic enough and it's not representing what the members want. There's a huge gulf between the members and, and, and the party at the moment, and the government particularly, which is dangerous for all. Is Rishi Sunak a Conservative Prime Minister? I think the point about Rishi and what we represent is that if the members had voted for Rishi, then we wouldn't be talking about Rishi as our leader. The fact that he was elected in a way that disenfranchised the members um, is the point here. You know, we're not anti-Rishi. David has said that. We're not anti-anybody that becomes our leader. We would we would funnel behind them. Whether we agreed with their policies or not, if the members agreed with those policies, if the electorate agreed with those policies, who are we to challenge those? So it's not about Rishi, it's about the members and how Rishi was voted for. And the fact of the matter is today, and these are the stark facts, is that the country voted, 43% of the popular vote voted for a Brexit manifesto headed up by Boris Johnson. And the facts of the matter are, for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly, that prime minister was removed, then the members voted for another person, and now the, the members who voted for that other person, Liz Trust, we've now been imposed with somebody that the members didn't vote for. That's the point. It's not Rishi, it's not personal to Rishi, um, it's about the process and disenfranchising the members and, more importantly, the electorate. Tomorrow we've got uh, the prospect of Mr Johnson appearing before a committee and answering questions. Uh, I think there's no secret that CDO um, feel pretty strongly about the way Mr. Johnson was treated by the party. Uh, would that be correct to say, or, or am I putting words into your mouth? I think he's being appallingly treated. I mean, he got the largest majority, 80 seat majority since Maggie Thatcher, 1987. Uh, and the Conservative Party, if you look at our track record, we've been just scraping in in 2010. We had to have a coalition. We only just got under Cameron in 2015, thanks to a referendum pledge actually on the EU, we squeezed in. Uh, but Boris gave us a big working majority. And there's no doubt that he has, he's a bit like Heineken, he, refers, he reaches parts that other politicians don't reach. It, 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 the Red Wall being a case in point. And I helped him in London a number of times campaigning. And we were just speaking to Labour and Lib Dem voters who said, well, we don't normally vote for Conservative, but we'll back Boris, you know. And he has this enormous appeal. But I would say, though, the caveat is that we're not just to bring back Boris campaign. The way we look at it, if the members want to bring back Boris, and there's, there is a lot of evidence they do want that, and the public do in, in many ways, then we respect that and we should get behind that. But we're not just about bring back Boris. Boris is actually probably, his life would be a lot better outside of politics he would not struggle to find employment. But the issue here is the electorate. You know, it's the electorate that have been treated appallingly by our party, and that's unacceptable. And starting point to stop that happening again is to change the constitution of the Conservative Party so that members have a much greater say uh, with our parliamentarians. And that is the whole point of the campaign for the, the Conservative Democratic Organisation. That's the whole point.
Thank you, Peter. You've you led us on very nicely to my final two questions, if I may. The first one is about uh, whether you feel that there is any prospect of changing leader before the next election. I don't rule anything out. Um, I mean, I, I was going to mention the polling. I mean, the polling is utterly disastrous at the moment for the Conservative Party. We're about 30 points behind Labour. And there doesn't seem to be any shift. I call it the Sunak slump in the terms that, you know, he's come in and there hasn't been any shift in the polling. When Boris Johnson resigned, he mentioned that he was only, we were only 2% behind in the polls. And now we're down to about 30%. And I think that is very, very significant. And what's going to happen, in my view, is that MPs, Conservative MPs, are going to panic probably just after the local elections. And they're going to say, How, who's who's best to save my seat? And they are ruthless. They were ruthless getting rid of Boris. But I think they'll actually look at getting him back because they know he's an election winner. And that would be very significant. So it's possible, yes. What I would say is that we're all passionate tribal conservatives here. But where does this put the party? If we knowingly go into the next election with the polls trashed, um, with the removal of a very popular leader, what does that say about our party? And what is the future of our party if we are prepared to act in that way without delivering on a manifesto that was widely backed throughout the country? And I think the big issue here is not whether the leader changes, but what state will the party be in if we carry on the way we are today? And that's my major concern. What you've touched on there, Peter, was uh, some issues that lead into my final question, which is about uh, the state of our democracy generally and what other parties might be able to learn from what CDO is doing. Do either of you have any comments on that? The problems that the Conservative Party faces are the same as Labour. I mean, you know, you've got Starmer getting rid of the former leader of the Labour Party. Now, that's their business. But it, it does seem that there's some extreme things going on. And I think also the equality of some of the Labour candidates is quite shocking. You look back to David Owen and, you know, and uh, some of the great names of Labour, and you compare them with the front bench now, and I'm afraid there's a lot missing. So I think um, it, it's very relevant to all parties, this, uh, mm. about you know sorting out the system, because it doesn't serve democracy well where we are at the moment. If you look at the way the common market has evolved over the last 40-odd years, when I voted for this country to join uh, the common market, back in the 70s, 76, I think it was. And, um, but if you, what we voted for back then was a common trading block, which is a great idea, especially after two world wars. And, you know, let's, let's trade with each other. Let's be nice to each other. And then what you saw was a major changing of the constitution of the European Union without ever asking the British people, whether they agree to that. So to me, what you're seeing today in political party, parties is the contempt that politicians generally, not specifically, but generally hold uh, for the British electorate. They've become so intoxicated with doing things and then pushing responsibility out to the European Union. This is what we want to do. And then, you know, whoever the the party leaders said, well, we can't change anything because we're in the European Union. And that that now is just what we're seeing today is just getting worse. And it's why we should come out of the European Union. We need to control uh, our own country. CDO, Brexit is all about democracy. I mean, Brexit was about restoring sovereignty, self-government. That was the number one reason for Brexit. And what we're up against is a inner establishment that is doing everything possible, firstly, legally within Parliament or illegally, particularly to stop it. Uh, and now the White Hall is doing everything possible to slow it down and overturn it. And the protocol issue is all part of that. In my view, it keeps us far too closely entwined with EU rules. 
uh, and we should break free. Uh, and all, but all of this comes back to well, who's in charge? If if the members aren't being listened to in the political parties, um, then who is in charge? It's Whitehall. It's the the block. The establishment blob is in charge. That's why democracy really matters. If we can get back control of the Conservative Party, have a real party reform, it will be listening to the members, and the members listen to the public. They're part of the public, for heaven's sake. And we will be back, you know, in the right kind of place. Gentlemen, Lord Crudders, David Campbell Bannerman, former MEP, you have both given us tremendous value today. Thank you so much for your time. I think the audience will be very interested in what you had to say about a whole range of different issues. Uh, is there anything that you would like to conclude with, either of you, on uh, your general views about the political landscape right now? What I would ask your listeners and viewers to do is, uh, if they agree with what they've heard today, to join Conservative Democratic Organisation and support us. Because if we can get enough members on board, and you don't need to be a member of the Conservative Party, you can be a Democrat. You can be. You could have voted Conservative, even if you uh, voted for another political party. You know, we we want to um, we want to be uh, embracing for political colour. So please sign up. Thank you. And thank you for all the great work you do, Lee. You know, you work as seven days a week, as, as well. You say, and and uh, facts for EU and CIB are very very important to this the, the campaign. On the CDO, uh, please look at conservativedems.co.uk. You can sign up. Uh, you come to our conference, 13th of May, in Bournemouth. Sign up there. It's going to be great. Jacob Rees-Mogg, Pretty Patel, Nadine Doris, and many others. Uh, real conservatives, you know, people that really care about the country with a lot of integrity will be coming. This is, uh, you know, a, a great conference. Please come along and get involved. It's the renewal of our party it's a renaissance and, and it's very, very important. Thank you. If you don't get your way with CDO, are you going to carry on supporting financially? I think it's up to the Conservative Party whether I support them or not. Um, you know, uh, at the moment, if they rang me up and asked me, I'd say no, because I think, you know, I as a member um, feel disenfranchised from the process of the way our leader was elected and the way the manifesto is being ignored by the current leadership. I'm, I'm still a loyal conservative. If you look at my voting record in the House of Lords, my voting record is, you know, 100% in favour of the Conservative government. I would donate to the Conservative Party tomorrow if it reverted back to being a centre-right party. And unless they do that, then I don't see, I can't personally donate to them. Lord Crudders, David Campbell, Bannerman, thank you very much for talking to us today. I think your contributions will be very interesting to all of our readers and our audience on YouTube. Uh, and we very much appreciate your time. Uh, we will put links to your events that you mentioned going forward. And uh, and thank you uh, for today. Thank you, Lee. Good luck.